Welcome to the Magnificast. Uh, this is a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean, a Catholic PhD student in philosophy at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. I'm Matt. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. My research interests are media archaeology and cultural theory and, uh, I don't know, Christianity and communism and stuff. Uh, <laughs> every week is just going to be like more of me like uh, adding a third thing to this. I'm just going to have no research interests for the rest of this podcast. Yeah. This is just who I am and I study here and whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, y- you should get some research interests to develop your brand, you know? No, nah, man, I don't, I don't have a brand, you know, I'm just too, uh, I'm not at the level, that's my brand. My brand is no brand. Oh, no brand. That's good. Yep. Yeah, It's it sells very well. I'm making a lot of money off of it. Uh, <laughs> college age men from 18 to 22 <laughs> love your brand of no yeah, brand. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right well before we get into the episode uh we have a new itunes review to read uh what's actually really awesome is that since we talked with daniel camacho and matt sitman uh we got many more followers and uh, a lot more people <laughs> leaving us itunes reviews which is the nicest thing in the entire world so thanks matt sitman thanks daniel camacho you guys done did it for us uh we got you gave us the bump I guess, or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but, like, we have more followers now, and that's, that's great. Uh, that's it's a hot journalist uh, bump. Oof. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, people love the journalists. The good ones, at least. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, we're, we're going to just, like, start working through these. It's kind of nice to have a backlog. So we're going to start with... Uh, we're going to start with a review from July 27th. So it is just a little bit in the past. Um but uh, the uh, title of this review is called The Magnificast Doesn't Disappoint. Five out of five stars. Oh, That's my gosh. I know. Uh, we should put a uh, an air, like a rap air horn in here. <laughs> <laughs> rap air horn, five out of five, does not disappoint. <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> this is by Kale Butler. Thank you, Kale Butler. Uh, Kale says, I've been listening to podcasts for almost 10 years. This is my first review. That is amazing. Uh, the Magnificast <laughs> is worth it. If you're, uh, if you're like me, recovering from a politically and theologically conservative upbringing, I am like you. Hello. <laughs> me uh, too. Now, <laughs> now seeking to reconcile leftist political views with Christianity, the Magnificast is a welcome resting place. If you've been leftist and Christian all along, uh, the Magnificast is for you, too. Uh, Matt and Dean provide a well of knowledge, a good dose of self, (laughs) a good dose of self-deprecating humor, and best (laughs) of all, good old conversation. From war and cinema to church camp to a bevy of chats about communism, socialism, the Magnificast doesn't disappoint. Uh, Okay, so there's a lot of things I really appreciate about this, but like, first of all, ten years is a long time to listen to a podcast. I mean, to different podcasts, but like ten years. Uh, How many podcasts do you think that is in ten years? Uh, too many, too many that I could think of. What is that? So, <laughs> 2007. That was uh, when this person started listening to podcasts. Um, right. That's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, what else was going on in 2007? Did Sh- did Shrek three come out then? Was there a Shrek movie? <laughs> Probably. That's how I kind of tell time is based yeah. on what what Shrek movie was uh, just out. Do you subdivide that time based on like uh, the Shrek spinoff movies, like Shrek Halloween, or uh, you know Shrek gets lost at Christmas, or whatever they are now? <laughs> Is there really a Shrek? Shrek gets lost at Christmas. Uh, I don't know. There's a Shrek <laughs> Christmas, and I can only assume that's the plot. So I made that last part up. Uh, hey, so uh, I actually did not know. I had no idea when Shrek the Third came out, but I was actually right <laughs> on 100. percent It is actually 2007. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's amazing. I'm impressed. Yeah, man. Uh, some uh, real synchronicity there. Some hive mind. <laughs> the, I don't know. The last uh, feature Shrek film before the Obama years. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh man, that great <laughs> that great Bush era <laughs> Shrek. <laughs> Bush era DreamWorks films. <laughs> Just like really like a lot of pro war stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very subtle, subtle anti power though. You know, like. Uh... Shine your shoes, watch your face. That's a good, <laughs> yeah, good that's joke like for, Shrek... the, for the evangelicals. That's what Shrek was all about, was really just obeying the rules. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, br- yeah, isn't, there's a scene in Shrek where I think he brushes his teeth. So, yeah, right on. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay. 
There's a lot of uh, um, well, it's, it's property rights. I don't know. That's got to be a thing. Ooh, get out of my swamp. Yeah, that's right. right. Oh, I mean, George Bush and, has said that before. I'm positive. Yeah, but then Shrek kind of goes through a lifetime transformation where it's like you can come in my swamp. The swamp, uh, swamps are th- are theft. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, cool. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks the, the Magnificast does not disappoint. Uh, just to remind everyone, <laughs> uh, at this point, it seems important to reiterate that point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Kale, for this review, uh, for this opportunity for me to uh, talk about Shrek. Uh, I guess what's really great about this too uh, is the last line where they say, uh, "From war and cinema to church camp to a bevy of chats about communism, socialism." Um, Dean and I actually regard war and cinema episode. Uh, as one of our favorites, yet probably one of the episodes people like the least. But uh, this, uh, this 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 uh, this listener is all about it. So what's up? I don't know. Yeah, that's cool. I dig that. Shout <laughs> out to good. Josh for a really magnificent guest. Uh, yeah, the Warren Cinema thing. That was good. Um, <laughs> Josh yeah. supports us on Patreon too, so I know that he'll listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was a fun episode. And then, oh man, there's like that really great, like weird, uh, that's when we were still doing half episodes too. And uh, we did the uh, little boy uh, Wikipedia reading. <laughs> yeah, that one Again, might disappoint, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was very fun for us. And uh, uh, that movie is going to become uh, very important again uh, once nuclear war breaks out. So <laughs> that's right. something to think about. <laughs> um all right good well yeah like matt was saying thanks kale that's great thanks for leaving that review uh after 10 years of your silence thanks for breaking it uh for us that's very kind of you so kind uh so this week uh we're talking about roland Bohr's book criticism of heaven which is part of a series on marxism and religion with a guy named john greenaway but you might know him as the lit crick guy on twitter uh that's how we knew him before we learned his name for uh this podcast so uh, it took us a. Uh, it took us way too long to learn his real name. <laughs> yeah, we did have to double check that uh, when we were recording. So, but it's true. It's John Greenaway. I hope. What if it's? What if I'm wrong now? That would be embarrassing. But yeah, too but late. Like, also, what if he didn't want us to say that, and now like we're doxing him? Oh, that's true. Now, now we're in trouble. <laughs> so, hey, sorry. Uh, so we'll spend some time in this episode talking about Roland Bohr's work in general, and uh, what he has to say about religion and the left, and how that's interesting to us. And then kind of to, I don't know, give an example of that, we'll turn to a chapter in the book that he wrote about uh, Althusser and his Catholic Marxism. So that should be good. Uh, we get some real Likrit guy uh, introduction to Althusser. So theory time, it's in the episode about halfway through. That's pretty fun. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Religion on the left. It's a real thing. Uh, and here we are talking about it again. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I've gotten so much out of the work that you you've, you all have been doing. I think it's been I think it's been amazing, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person who would say that. Um, um, I think it's so necessary. I think it's so overdue for there to be a kind of serious uh, consideration of theology and and leftist politics rather than just this kind of milk toast liberalism that. Uh, is not really interested. I think it was Matt. Was, was it you? A, a while ago, you were tweeting that like a lot of Christian writing is so reluctant to actually do politics. Uh, yeah. And I think that's I think that's one of the things that what you've sort of set up here can be a really valuable space for to like help encourage uh, Christians to to kind of do politics and not just sort of have a kind of weak theoretical political theology, but actually to have something that is concrete. You know, to use yeah. that is material that is that is actually going out and doing things in the world. Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate you saying that. Um, it's it's cool. It's cool that people like what we do. It's really weird, also, 
uh, Dean and I are always really shocked that people listen to this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, but they do. I don't know. Oh, should I should I should I say that uh, I'm giving you both money, or I'm giving the show money? If you'd like, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, okay. I just don't, <laughs> I don't know. Is that, is I mean, that a matter is, of integrity? Is, I don't really know. It is a matter of... Um, it's about ethics, Matt. It's about ethics in... <laughs> ethics in uh, podcasting. Christian podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't we'll, know. We'll, I'll, uh, I'll include some of this in the podcast. And, uh, <laughs> it'll, it will be known. It will be known. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that for $5 a month, you, you too can make your ideologies known on our podcast. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that... That is that is what I'm here for to spread communist ideology and uh... <laughs> like good I don't know man like all right <laughs> honestly we'd let you do it for free but you know whatever um well let's get started uh what have you guys been up to this week John what are you what are you doing uh hello hello everybody my name is John uh, I have been finishing my my thesis this week um which I will be handing in. Uh, probably by the end of the month, which is really fun, uh, because I'm at that stage of, of the writing project where you basically go through and spot all of the small mistakes that you should have caught like when you were writing, but you're like, oh, I'll go back and fix that in the edit. <laughs> so, so now I'm, I'm spending my time mostly getting very angry at past versions of me, because it's like... <laughs> notes like oh put something good here uh find this citation that you liked and i'm like oh why was i not <laughs> why was i like <laughs> past me was just incredibly lazy so i'm i'm at the point of like trying to finish up a coherent draft of my uh, phd uh and i'm also trying to start work on my next big uh research project which uh, my phd is on imaginative apologetics and gothic literature um, which is really fun, and so I am. I am kind of by training a gothicist, which is the coolest job title. Which I do not. I don't. <laughs> I don't wear nearly enough black for for, for the <laughs> research that I do. Well, a lot of Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but my next my next thing is a big look at Marxism and its relation to horror and gothic from like the 1850s all the way up to the present. So I have basically been been staying inside a lot, looking at footnotes. You know, it's been fun. It's been fun. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, that sounds really cool. Uh, yeah, being a gothicist is very cool. You have to get some good, uh, like some good uh, business cards with that on it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> just be all black, just all black. Yeah. Uh, junior high, uh, junior highs could hire you for your gothic services and I planning mean, some goth dances and raves. But they they have to say your name three times. You just show up. They don't even I know, have to hire you. I just appear <laughs> behind them in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that's neat. Uh, Dean, what have you been doing, man? Uh, what have I been doing? Um, well, the usual, the usual grind. But the big news, I guess, in Toronto is that this woman named Bonnie Briggs uh, died this past week, and she started this homeless memorial that is here. And I read a story on it for America Magazine a while back, and I have some friends who organize it. So they had like a big uh, memorial for her that I went to, um, which was really cool and interesting to see she died sort of suddenly and unexpectedly she was in her early 60s so it was kind of sad because she's a huge figure in the community here but also really neat you know to see like different people from her like very uh very wide-ranging life she used to be homeless herself and she like plays in all these bands around town and stuff so yeah, I guess I was the big thing that I did this week was uh, spend some time there outside of all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, that's nice, I guess, that you went to that. Yeah, it's a good thing. I think it's strange going, actually, because uh, like when I first went there, it was to write the story. And so everybody knows me as like the person who writes for the Jesuit magazine. And uh, it's really interesting because... Um, like, they'll ask me, like, hey, do you know if, um, you know, uh, some Jesuit priests are going to come here or, uh, like, some other Catholics in town are going to be here? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, I emailed them, but uh, they're not here today, so sorry. It's, like, very <laughs> awkward. <laughs> it's like, listen, I'm not representative of whatever it is they're doing. I'm just, like, here by myself. So. <laughs> right. 
funny. yeah, but it's weird. It's weird to be sort of embarrassed by the fact that you can't just point to you know five or six other people um, and be like, yeah, of course they're here because that's what they're supposed to be. So that's kind of an interesting thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. Not um, that I'm like a very good Christian or anything. Just like I went there for a job and now I go well, there more regularly. <laughs> you might be better than most, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Um, uh, what have you been up to, Matt? Yeah, uh, I took a break this week from getting ready for my classes and decided to finish up some research projects I've been doing. Um, uh, I feel really proud of myself because I finished and submitted two journal articles yesterday, and uh, nice. that is a very good feeling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I've been working on them for like a very long time, so um, it feels good to just kind of like have some completed completed ish versions and let letting someone else read them for a bit so I can stop thinking about them. <laughs> uh, but it feels nice. It feels nice to do it. <laughs> it feels uh, very accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Like, great. like all, like all PhD students, I now have huge amounts of guilt that I haven't been writing more for <laughs> just, just by uh, hearing no about your productivity. <laughs> no, I mean, the only way I got that stuff done was having like an entire summer open to me. Uh, it's <laughs> writing articles is so difficult and uh, I don't know. It, it's hard. It's so hard um, <laughs> to find time to do those things. Cool. Well, um, John, uh, thanks. John slash the Lit Crit guy, uh, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. We appreciate it immensely. We also appreciate all of the retweets because uh, we have gained a buttload of followers from you, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> One actual uh, precise buttload. We've measured it. Uh, a metric, a metric buttload. A metric one, me. one metric butt ton of people. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is my that is absolutely my my pleasure. Uh, it is. Uh, as I as I as I was saying, you know, I think this this what you folks are doing is so exciting, so necessary, uh, and so overdue for there to be kind of space for a serious consideration of of uh, leftism and and Christian thought, um, because it's been so kind of marginalised and and neglected. So I, I am I am I am here for for all of it. I'm here for trolling the Acton Institute. <laughs> I, <laughs> I I actually I actually do have a small bone to pick with both of you, which is if I hadn't listened to the Magnificast, I would have never have been introduced to Rod Dreher. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and oh boy, <laughs> yeah, Rod Dreher is terrible. Uh, you you were underselling. Just <laughs> it is <laughs> it is not good. So like. Obviously, that's that is something I hold against you for bringing there. Roger into my life and into my timeline. <laughs> but that is okay. That is okay. I will let it slide. Yeah. yeah on the bright side, uh, he he blocked me on Twitter before we did the episode, um, so I can't like retweet him. So you can <laughs> say thanks for that. I guess I've been spared. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, please block me, Rod. Please bro block me and spare me from your <laughs> terrible opinions on literally everything. Uh, yeah, there is so a bad. there is a spare the rod, spoil the child joke here, but I just can't. Find <laughs> <it>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my god, no! <laughs> um, shoot. <laughs> so uh, thank you, thank you for. Ha I guess that's what I'm <laughs> saying. Thank you, yes. thank you for having having me on, and uh, I will I will forgive the introduction of Rod Reyer into my into my mind, occupying bits of my brain that could be more profitably spent doing other things, uh, getting angry at his as his his politics and terrible writing uh, and <laughs> theology. So <laughs> just yeah. all of it, just all of it. We will we'll just move past it. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, well, for for folks who like don't know who you are uh, because they're not, not on Twitter, I guess. Um, who are you, John? Who's the Liquid guy? What's the uh, uh, what do you say at parties? Hi, I'm the Liquid guy. This is who I am. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so I started the Liquid guy when I finished my uh, MA, and I had like um, gotten kind of into theory. Uh, without sounding which sounds kind of obnoxious but you know i was like hey maybe i'll just spend some time uh tweeting about this stuff and maybe it'll pick up maybe a, like a few other dozen people who are interested in this kind of thing uh but it picked up quite a few more people than that um which 
always sort of blows me away that there, that there are quite a lot of people who want to follow along. So I, I tweet about theory and academia and politics and my thesis, and I do long threads about various uh, theoretical or philosophical bits of work. Um, yeah, so I try and sort of like popularize and explain various thinkers who people may not have come across if they have not been lucky enough or privileged enough to go to spend too much of their money and too much of their time reading these books. So I try and sort of pass it on to people. 140 characters at a time. <laughs> um, so, uh, quick quick side note, actually. Uh, the, so, uh, if, you, if you're not on Twitter and you want to find out more about uh, John the lit crit guy uh you can find him at lit crit guy and also all of his all of his good theory uh threads are hashtag theory time um this coming semester in my uh in my media theory class i have assigned um a, an exercise where they all have to do theory times every week when we read something so uh <laughs> get get ready for uh your hashtag and brand to be watered down by undergrads <laughs> <laughs> I I am I am so excited about that. I think it's I think uh you know it's it's really easy to see it as something kind of uh silly and self-indulgent, but I think there's something kind of fun about it. Twitter as a medium forces kind of brevity and precision, which are two yeah. really good writing skills, which a lot of the theorists, the people who are categorized in that umbrella as theorists don't really have because you can write a six and a half, you know, 600 page book on uh, continental interpretations of Marx's thought, but, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have the same punch if you can't, you know, it's nice to get that stuff out there is what I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. Um, just the, the practice of like, um, I don't know, reading, reading something really dense and hard and then sort of recentering yourself and like, and then trying to express it in 140 characters is a really hard thing to do and a really good practice. So yeah, totally. Um, good exercise for sure. I am so excited about reading those undergrad threads. I am. I am. I am. You going to... might change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, it'll. It'll be fun at least. Um, yeah. Um, so that's what I. I do. I'm. I'm also doing a PhD uh, in the kind of interdisciplinary, interstitial field of the Gothic and theology as loosely as possible and i'm kind of interested in these in the ways that theology intersects in various other uh kind of areas of of study and life so that's why i'm interested in in from my theory background i'm interested in kind of marxism uh in, from my literary background i'm interested in um uh horror and kind of marginal forms of writing uh rather than sort of novels and realism and i suppose uh just by virtue of being a being a, a Christian and a Marxist, I'm interested in theology as well. Uh, cool. Well, let's get into it then. <laughs> let's do this. So, um, this week we read some selections from uh, Roland Bohr's, um, I, I don't know, um, giant massive works relating <laughs> Marxism and Christianity. Um <laughs> So we uh, had a lot to pick from, and uh, we chose to read the introduction together, and then also a section on uh, on uh, Louis Althusser's uh, writing and how it might relate to ecclesiology and thinking about the church theologically, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, pretty wild because Althusser um, is, I don't know, a member of the French Communist Party, not the first person you think of probably when you think of church, so uh, kind of wild, but uh, pretty interesting when it comes down to it. Uh, I don't know. So, uh, John, do you want to take a second and kind of just tell us about uh, the like the Bohr's work overall and like what the point is and like what he's doing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So this uh, Bohr is kind of a, a fascinating uh, academic, and uh, in a lots in lots of ways, um, he uh, is the son of a Presbyterian minister, and he did a, his undergrad in theology, um, and then started reading an awful lot of Marxism. Uh, and then back in this volume comes out in 2007, and over over the course of from about 2007 to about 2012, he writes these these five volumes uh, called the uh, Critique of Heaven and Earth, where he basically provides um, essentially exegesis on uh, various passages from Marxist thinkers, 
uh, and how their work relates to and responds to um, religion and theology and the Bible. So this first volume, which is yeah, 500 pages long, uh, <laughs> which is just sort of a bit uh, mind-blowing, moves through uh, thinkers like Ernst Bloch, uh, Terry Eagleton, Antonio Gramsci, Althusser, uh, uh, and finishes with Adorno as well. And all of these thinkers in various ways are kind of responding to the uh, kind of theological tradition uh, in various forms. So he uh, picks up on three sort of subsets of ways in which Marxists have have responded and kind of engage with theology. There are the Marxists who kind of do uh, biblical criticism and exegesis. There are the uh, Protestant Marxists, which is uh, probably where I would be put. Uh, and there are the there are the small C Catholic uh, Marxists as well, which is where Althusser comes in. Um, yeah, that that taxonomy is really interesting, um, and it shows up right up front in this book. It's kind of how he arranges it, I guess. So mm-hmm. he's got the biblical Marxists, which um, I think are just limited to Bloch and Benjamin. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, as you were saying, the Catholic and Protestant Marxists. And it was so fun to read that through, actually. I appreciated it because it is hard to sort out what Marxists tend to get from Christian theology, uh, you know, willingly or unwillingly. Like, whether it's something that they choose to engage or something that, uh, as we'll see in Althusser's case, something that doesn't really leave them. Um, so, yeah. What did you guys think about that, actually? That I mean, I don't want to just uh, go full throttle into this conversation if you want to do some more setup, but, like... I thought that was a pretty neat, neat device. Yeah, I agree that uh, the taxonomy that they give is pretty fun. Um, biblical, Catholic, Protestant. So um, let me make sure I have this straight. You guys can correct me. So the biblical section is, um, so it's Benjamin and Bloch, and it's about how like Marxists relate to scripture in the Bible, I guess. that's Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and that makes sense to me, I guess. Um and then Catholic, the Catholic uh, Marxists are Althusser, Eagleton, Gramsci. Those are those are guys thinking about structure and uh, ecclesiology, mm-hmm. how Marxists relate to like I guess society and uh, like societal organizations, which is uh, pretty cool. And then the Protestants uh, that come out in the book are Zizek and Adorno. <laughs> is, there, is there another one, or are those the only two? I can't. Uh, see I right think now. those. I think those are the only two. Yeah. So it's. Um, Zizek and Adorno are the other are the two Protestants, which are which is a kind of <laughs> a slightly incongruous uh, yeah, I know, d- right? duo. But <laughs> but I think from different points of view they do sort of fit because Adorno's um, habilitation thesis is on Kierkegaard and is this incredibly dense bit of writing, which I don't I don't know of anyone, even Adorno, even someone who's like really into Adorno, who has ever read. <laughs> this thing on Kier- Kierkegaard and the aesthetic, it's a bit of a bit of a slog. And Zizek is really influenced by Badiou's reading of Paul, uh, which, you know, that's the kind of like post, what is it, 95 turn back to Paul, where Paul becomes a really important figure for, and this, uh, this idea of universalism, the idea of grace, beca- and those, those are kind of like distinctly Protestant ideas. Um, but yeah, I think the taxonomy is really helpful and is a really useful way of organizing how uh, the different ways in which we might kind of seek to br- build a kind of connection between uh, leftist and Marxist thought and theological thought and practice. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's a weird sort of taxonomy too, though, because um, I was just thinking about the different ways he could have organized it, and I feel like uh, one sort of glaring omission is like a uh, like Jewish Marxists in particular, um, mm. as opposed to biblical per se or something. Uh, Cause I feel like Adorno is uh, way more of a Jewish Marxist than he is a Protestant Marxist. Like, yeah, he wrote a thing about Kierkegaard, I guess. Um, but I don't know. It doesn't really determine his thought per se. Um, he always strikes me as like a, um, you know, he has this very depressed kind of eschatology where uh, the Messiah <laughs> never showed up in the first place and then probably mm-hmm. won't in the last place either. Uh, hope, like, maybe it will, hopefully it will, but, like, probably not. Um, and what, wouldn't you say that Benjamin's sort of in the same boat, too? That he is, yeah. like... I mean, Benjamin, obviously, way more hopeful than I think Adorno is, but still, it's, like, that expectation of a Messiah. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the messianic quality is uh, 
promissory and hasn't happened yet. Mm. Uh, is seems more Jewish than Christian, but but still maybe the relationship they have to the to the source uh, is more characteristically Christian than Jewish. I don't know. And maybe I guess I guess what I would say is maybe that. Well, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point, and is kind of a glaring omission of what he's done. But I think Adorno and and Benjamin are often lumped together uh, anyway, th- thanks to like on books on like the Frankfurt School, they're considered as pretty like. Uh, in a way, they're considered as like very. You can consider them homogeneous, uh, homogeneously as part of right. oh, their Frankfurt School thinkers, and that involves this and this. So I think there is. I think maybe that distinction is useful uh, up to a certain point in maybe disrupting that and going. Actually, Adorno and Benjamin have kind of very different concerns in some way, even though they are definitely responding to and kind of challenging one another. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that is, it is. Um, it, it was a little bit striking to me too that they were separated, that they weren't just lumped together. So that is kind of a nice part of the taxonomy and kind of putting them in different different spots. Mm. Yeah, and if nothing else, I feel like it kind of shows that uh, there's a lot to say about the relationship between religion and um, Marxism generally, and there are different ways of kind of sorting it out. The way the Bora has done it is clearly a helpful, like heuristic device. Um, yeah, there's no no denying that. Uh, but yeah, sometimes I'm just like, uh, I don't know if Adorno is very Protestant <laughs> or uh, whatever. Um, all the Catholics are right, though. He got those right. <laughs> mm-hmm. With uh, with this taxonomy in mind, the biblical Catholic Protestant Marxist thinkers, how can we use this to read religious, theological, and Marxist literature together, do you think? Like, how is this uh, instrumental in our understanding going forward? Or, or is it? Thinking about it, thinking about it from that point of view, yeah. uh, I'm not sure terribly useful maybe this is my this is my suspicion because my my concern about this taxonomy is that it kind of necess- it, it it necessarily involves a certain uh, amount of knowledge on the part of the person who's coming across it because it's like you said Dean that like all of the Catholic Marxists ah they're right yeah okay and that's because we, <laughs> we kind of have it we, we all of us have like the shared sense of what is it to be Catholic and a Marxist Whereas I don't necessarily know that people who are not that familiar with theology or, or various strands of Marxism would go, oh yeah, of course, Althusser is a is a Catholic thinker. Because what's kind of important is how do you get those uh, writings and those those thinkers and those ideas to connect with certain kind of issues that are affecting people materially speaking, right? I mean. I think as we get into the Althusser, we'll see that maybe the kind of clear thing is not. Um, just the fact that he's a very Catholic writer and a very Catholic theologian and a Marxist, but he's also concerned with the church, which is like the practical organization of a group of people committed to a certain belief. And I think maybe that's a better way of thinking about it. It's about the kind of issue that this can be tied to rather than which which box do we place them inside of. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good, a good note. I mean, I guess to me... Um... It was just, it's helpful to see the way that uh, religious faith is so integrated in the lives of these different thinkers and that uh, it's probably way easier to draw a connection between being a religious person and being a Marxist than um, than like the Acton Institute or whatever would want you to think. <laughs> um, I mean, this is something that Althusser says, isn't it? Yeah. That- you know, he was a Catholic, and then, oh, yeah, obviously, I became a communist. <laughs> it's, like a, it's a clear and obvious transition that he makes. And, and to see that kind of in each of these thinkers is, uh, I, I don't know, really helpful to me, at least, just like existentially or something, that like whatever my life is is not actually as weird as I think it is. Uh, <laughs> well, um, this taxonomy is pretty cool. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on with it. Um, but it does center on Marxist thinkers, and um, since we are a Christian, uh, since we are a podcast about Christianity and the left, and not just Christianity and Marxism, I wonder if we could, um, if we could use this taxonomy to think about the left more broadly in Christianity. Like, um, I don't know. We talked about anarchism kind of a lot on this podcast, and I know s- some of the listeners that we have are anarchists, and like, I don't know, good for them. Um, so I don't know. How would we? How would we use this to maybe think about some? Uh, Christian anarchists as well as Marxists. Do you, do you think there's a relationship there that we could use? Dean, you can chime in here if you want, man. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, I do. 
<laughs> I think so. Um, it's funny to think of, of uh, how anarchism and Christianity have related or not, in, especially in the last century, because there have been, I feel like Christians have, in a lot of cases, been more willing to pick on anarchist strands um, than, at least in North America and Europe, uh, than Marxist ones. So, for example, like when I was an adolescent and I was uh, slowly dipping my toes in critical political discourses, anarchism made more sense to me than Marxism just by virtue of being like, yeah, well, the state's bad. And you're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Of course, the state is bad. Like the state's the one that like killed Jesus. So, you know, <laughs> it fits in a certain way um, that like uh, uh, Marxist critique of capital doesn't land as quickly. Um, so I was thinking about people like uh, Tolstoy or you know, Virilio or Ilul, um, these kinds of figures that have a relationship to it. And I do think that you can slowly untease, like, uh, or tease out the, uh, the way in which their particular religious traditions, uh, inform their anarchism. Uh, Ilul is clearly, like, he's extremely Calvinist. Um, yeah. he is super into the Bible, but he's also super into, like, Providence and, uh, you know, almost like the elect, um, the anarchists are almost like a kind of elect community in the world <laughs> in a weird sort of way, uh, which is kind of troubling um, to me anyhow. Uh, but like Virilio's uh, anarchism is clearly very anarchist. I mean, he or sorry, his anarchism is very Catholic. Uh, mm. He he picks up a lot of different um, kind of Catholic assumptions about solidarity and identifying with the poor and that sort of thing. And that's the language that he uses. So. Can there be yeah. one more volume? One more volume on, on like anarchism <laughs> and Christianity. Dean, I was gonna no, stop no. you for a second because you you said that Virilio's anarchism was very anarchist, and I was gonna stop yeah. you because it's actually not very anarchist. It's not very <laughs> anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can we backtrack like uh, a few minutes though? Uh, because Dean, you you kind of started saying that um, that like anarchism was sort of like your I don't know one pathway that you took to get from I don't know wherever you were in Christianity towards like a leftist Christianity. Yeah. And that's really interesting because like, I mean, it's the same, same experience I had too was, I don't know. I was like, um, I was 18 and, uh, an evangelical and, uh, I was programmed to think that the state was very bad because of, uh, I don't know, pro-life issues and like whatever else. <laughs> and, uh, that like, uh, that transition of like the, the, the hate of, of state power was a was kind of the way I made the jump from like evangelical Christianity to anarchist Christianity, um, and that's uh, thinking about it now very strange um, <laughs> because like the the pathway the pathway from like the right to the left is the hatred of the state and then there's like a rehabilitation of understanding what <laughs> the state might mean on the other side of that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, right. So, but I think that's that's actually a really that's that's actually really cool because that is that's not the kind of journey that I sort of went on even though I think I I, I kept, come from that same sort of evangelical Protestant background um, when I was a teenager um, but I think that shows there's a kind of political opportunity here that like all of those huge camps and those mega churches could so easily be subverted by sort of like radical anarchist cells within them that that's all it would take is to direct that hatred towards the state away from the issue of like reproductive justice or yeah. um, women's healthcare and direct yeah. it towards things you know i think that's 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 maybe one of the grounds on which maybe leftist christians should be more optimistic than they are uh, i get the <laughs> yeah, feeling well, yeah. you know there's, there's a lot of hope that, right <laughs> that's right it's funny because that kind of did happen in uh, like the mid-2000s um so with the new monastic communities in particular, like, uh, so Shane Cloburn is the big exponent, I feel like, um, in terms of publishing, you see him around. But he wrote this book called Jesus for President uh, during the uh, 2008 election. And I actually it was, think I have a copy of that on my shelf over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good. Uh, it's very good. Um, it's really fun. And uh, But basically, that's the idea, is it's like, hey... Um, you know all that stuff that like you kind of don't like about feeling alienated in the society as a Christian and all the stuff. Like you should feel that way, and here's how. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like a pretty fascinating strategy. I mean, it sucked me in for sure. Like I was at the time going to like an evangelical Baptist church, and uh, I was like, yeah, this is like the biblical way to think. This has got to be right. So uh, um, it's it's it's, like, it's more it's, it's like less speculative than it seems. It's so appealing that my mom has a copy of the book and she liked it. Yeah, my <laughs> mom does too. I mean, it's like. Yeah. So step one, like, um, 
aren't you mad about the state? Step two, aren't you mad about private property? And then, <laughs> and, then and then you're there, and it's fine. I mean, I, I think that move from, like, Shane Claiborne to Bakunin and Peter Kroptokin is, is maybe a bit of a jump, but I think that's really doable. <laughs> I, I think so too it's not it's again it's like that that gap between uh leftist thinking and christianity is not as massive as joe carter at the acton institute wants you to believe oh okay. um, no 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 not at all not at all <laughs> well so on that point then um maybe we can talk about a few anarchist thinkers and how they fit into this taxonomy um uh dean you said that virilio he's a he's a catholic thinker and an anarchist how do you think his how do you think his thought is explicitly Catholic and anarchist? Um, yeah, uh, I mean he thinks that it is, so that helps. Um, so I can just be, be like, <laughs> what he says stuff. Uh, but more more seriously, I guess. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting kind of implicit Catholic commitments that Virilio brings out, like uh, like the turn to being upset about violence that has happened in Catholicism in the last hundred years um, and these kind of anti-nuclear sentiments uh, those are things that Virilio has all kind of imbibed on purpose um, but even in terms of doctrine like the preferential option for the poor as it's been called in liberation theology and now even in papal documents um, you know that's clearly there with Virilio that's where he finds his um, comfortable position I guess like he says in a few places he has trouble being a Marxist um, for a lot of reasons uh, but I think that one thing that sustains his anarchism is that he can fall back on these kind of pre-political commitments he's made at church. Like, well, I really like poor people. I don't think that they should suffer. Um, you know, I think the state has been overall a problematic thing in human history. So, like, I don't want to do that. And the church isn't really running a whole lot of states these days anyhow. So uh, a lot of Catholics have slowly moved in that direction, I think. So, yeah, uh, once you... You have eyes to see, I guess, as you're reading it, kind of keeps keeps showing up. Yeah. Um, as you're saying that, I was thinking through like um, like Tolstoy is another pretty big figure in Christian anarchism. Um, if you if you don't know, he wrote a book called The Kingdom of God Is Inside You, mm. and uh, it, it is an extremely. I, I mean, okay, I guess I would just say that he's probably like a very Protestant anarchist thinker. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, even from the the commitments that he makes in the book are super pious, like. Um, I, I haven't read the book in a while, but I remember, like, he's, like, going through the Sermon on the Mount, and, the, and he's just, like, writing, like, he's thinking through it, and he thinks, like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like, right. Whoa, how great. <laughs> like, his, like, uh, his, like, sort of reading of some of that is, like, super literal, first of all, which is interesting, and that's kind of found, founds his pacifism, but also, like, he just thinks that's really awesome, and, like, that's it. Um <laughs> And uh, the, also the, the the main idea, too, in, in The Kingdom of God is Inside You is, like, a really, like, uh, personal religion, too, that's, I think, pretty Protestant. Probably a reason that it appealed to me so much when I was an evangelical. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe I'd yeah. him in the, uh, the, I remember, the different type uh, of Protestant category. I remember reading him, though, when I was an adolescent and being, like, uh, he, uh, he has a real sort of Jeffersonian approach to the Bible. Like, he doesn't like miracles, and he throws out all the supernatural stuff, and then you're left yeah. with this kind of ethical core, right? And uh, so it's it's also a, a sort of... It's a really weird, like, modern, uh, modernist Protestantism, which is <laughs> pretty, pretty weird, but fine, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some kind of connection between Tolstoy II and some, like, Mennonite sects in Russia. Mm. I'm not oh, yeah. 100% sure what the deal with that is. That all, all I remember is that there is one. So <laughs> maybe he's an Anabaptist thinker even in some ways. Yeah. Well, I think it's true that there is a kind of radicalism that's often elided. I was, you know, looking up people like Thomas Munzner back mm -hmm. in the 1500s calling for uh, omnia sunt comnia, uh, communa, everything in yeah. common. And like... The next sentence after he makes that kind of declaration is that if people won't do it, they should be executed. <laughs> <laughs> like, so it's like it's forcible revolution. Uh, but that you know that idea of kind of like very a very Protestant idea of the individual faith of you know of no yeah. uh, ecclesial authority does have a kind of real radical streak in it. So there there totally should be some this this uh, intersection that Venn diagram between anarchism and Christian thought is really not that far apart at all. Yeah, for sure. Um, when I was thinking through some of these these anarchist thinkers, um, one person I kept kind of coming back to, who's kind of an odd 
odd person in this conversation is Simon Critchley, who I don't think is a Christian. He was um, my PhD supervisor, um, which is funny and weird. Um, but Simon is an awesome guy, and he writes a ton about anarchism and a ton about Christianity. Um, book recommendation, if you've never read The Faith of the Faithless, you should, because it's fun. Um, and I was thinking about how he fits into this, maybe, because, I mean, not a religious person himself, he does have a lot of religious ways of thinking, um, especially in the way he engages with religion. I wonder if, if maybe, I, I don't know, I was thinking about how I'd categorize him in this taxonomy, and I was kind of thinking that he was a very biblical anarchist, that he... Uh, <laughs> He has a strong relation to texts, um, whether they're biblical or otherwise. Uh, he uh, has a way of, of bringing those out in his work that I think is pretty interesting. Yeah, totally. I was uh, I was just reading Faith of Faithless uh, yesterday, actually, as it's a big part of one of my PhD chapters. So heartily recommend it as well. Um, it's and a I think you're right. Book. It's incre- I yeah, think that's... it's brilliant. I think it's just superb. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. He is he is a kind of uh, a theological thinker, even if he tries to say that he isn't a theologian, um, and I think he's definitely the, the the idea of being very text focused. I think it's is a hundred percent right. But that notion of the kind of uh, ethical demand, the kind of infinite demand of the of the other in front of you, which you have to respond to, that infinitely demanding ethics that he puts forward also like requires a great deal of, of action as well it requires that you give something of yourself um so he's he is definitely uh someone who i would also put in i would definitely if i were to expand this a little bit he would he'd be one of those people yeah for sure um sorry this is sort of a side point um and it's not uh it's not central to the discussion here but i thought i'd point it out too um in Bohr's discussion and in the discussion that we've been having too um we're, we're like picking people out of a very specific canon and i think that is fine um because i don't know it's the canon we have but it's weird it's weird that everyone that we're picking is like uh from the west <laughs> like um so, like enrique Dussel is someone who's like uh impacted greatly by theology and uh would probably fall into the more catholic way of thinking the the catholic not necessarily a marxist but a catholic leftist thinker who's not Catholic, really, um, that kind of gets left out of the discussion. Uh, I was just wonder, I was just kind of thinking through that, like, Bohr's, um, I don't know, uh, overarching structure is incredibly Western, and that kind of is a bummer to me. And it's it's strange, actually, because he is, he is a professor uh, in Australia, and he's also a professor in China. And he's, right. he's like, really involved in Chinese communism, Uh as a distinct kind of strain of it. And I, I think you're right. It's kind of a little bit sad that there's so much that has been left out. Um, you're right. It is, it is, yeah, it's, it is very, it is very, it is like the kind of Western Marxist approach rather than being as broad as he would maybe like you to think. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I, I guess I'm like not upset about it. It's just like, it just bums me out because it's a framework that I think is interesting and that there's so many people that you could put into this framework. So maybe he'll write five more volumes on like, Latin American thinkers. Or, or even because... like a, uh, like a single woman would be fine. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Right. <laughs> I've, I've just uh, been checking through some of the others. Uh, like, and the second volume is a little better, you know, but it's still very Western because that one covers uh, people like Julia Kristeva and Rosa sure. Luxemburg. But you're right. This is, this okay. is kind of, uh, you know, there should be more in here. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I don't know. Um, just a nice caveat. Yeah, that's worth making. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. So, yeah, uh, let's circle back to what he's actually talking about here a little bit. Um, that taxonomy is good. Uh, another thing I thought was really good in the introduction, just that uh, – he really makes this appeal, and we've said this already, but I just want to highlight it again. He makes this appeal to saying, um, you know, the left and uh, religious traditions broadly construed uh, are not alien discourses, despite the fact that they've been treated that way by both uh, a lot of religious authors and Marxist authors. And he has, like, some good access to grind in that introduction, I think, where he says, you know, I don't understand why people don't talk about this when it's so obvious. Like if you just read mm-hmm. some of the stuff, like it's there and 
you get this real sense that he's just upset that he had to write this book. Like, <laughs> how come other people haven't talked about this when it's so on the nose? And, like, I think that's right. That's how I felt, at least in my own relationship to Marxism. Like, every time I've read somebody like Benjamin or whatever, I mean, I study at a place called the Institute for Christian Studies, so, like, whatever. We Like, my institution has an eye for that sort of thing, but I've always understood uh, Marxism as an implicitly kind of religious community um, of thought. So, uh, I like that point a lot, that uh, you actually don't have to go digging too hard to, like, do the kind of work that he's doing. No, I mean, for some of these things, it's completely integral to their kind of overall uh, political project, right? I mean, Bloch's Atheism and Christianity is one of his major monographs, one of his big books right. that he that he spends a lot of time uh, putting out into the world. But uh, you're right there. I think it's it's born out of a kind of mutual suspicion on both sides of one another, and uh, as you say, a refusal for a lot of people to just not read the stuff. <laughs> so, John, uh, can we ask you to do like a, a lit crit theory guy, um, lit crit guy thread here uh, on this podcast? Like, if you were, you know, if you were trying to popularize Althusser just in general, um, what would you say about him? Uh, okay, so I would say that he is. Um, okay, so he is a French communist. He is a very gifted student as a young man. He gets into the ENS, the kind of prestigious uh, school in Paris. His place is deferred because he's enlisted to uh, fight in World War II. Um, and he comes back uh, from the war um, sort of quite, I think, profoundly damaged. Um, he comes back quite seriously mentally ill and he would be mentally ill for all of his life. Um, and there is, there, you know, something very profoundly uh, damaging happens to him during that time, as, as it does for so many people. He takes up residence uh, at the ENS. He has a room in the hospital wing um, because he is just regularly not, not well at all. Um, he is, throughout the 30s and 40s, uh, a Catholic, and he writes for various uh, Catholic journals on issues of, um, of theology and politics. And then in the early 40s, I think it is, he joins the French Communist Party. Um, and there is a, there's an overlap, really, of maybe about two or three years where he is, he's getting more and more in, interested in, in uh, communist politics uh, whilst moving away from the Catholic Church. And there is a kind of decisive break that happens uh, at one point where he sort of basically severs the connection in his in his thought and his writing between religion and Marxism. He is very structuralist in his approach to Marxism. Uh, his big famous essay is, of course, the one on ideology and ideological state apparatuses. Apparatus. Um, and he, he produces a lot of... Um, what he, he tries to sort of write against this tendency to humanize Marx, and he definitely wants to position Marx as a philosopher. Um he gets into various sort of uh, theoretical skirmishes with figures within the French Communist Party. He is uh, peripheral, but around during the 68 um, student uprising in Paris, which he later decries um, as sort of infantile leftism, uh, which is a little harsh. Um, <laughs> so it, he, uh, has, he, sees a, he sees a psychotherapist as a psychoanalyst for much of his life, um, but he increasingly his mental health begins to deteriorate, uh, begins to sort of fall apart, and uh, he one evening runs out into the street saying that he had strangled his wife uh, in the midst of a of a psychotic break. He is then uh, institutionalized and publishes very little, um, and is sort of forgotten uh, a bit from sort of French intellectual life for a while. Uh, some of his students are extremely influential. Etienne Balibar studied with him. Uh, Rancière studied with him. Um, but for, for a long time, he, he was sort of persona non grata, as it were. So his work is um, interested in the kind of in scientific Marxism. His big sort of 
idea is this notion of an epist of a of a break in Marx's body of writing between the young Marx, who's very invested in kind of Hegelian thinking, and the more scientific Marx, who's moved beyond Hegel uh, uh, into his later works of political economy. The 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 break is a very hotly contested, and I I think it's probably fair to say not really that widely accepted anymore in readings of Marx. Um, but I think his work still has a lot of interest, especially around the notions of ideology. I think that's probably where the most fruitful uh, uh, stuff can be drawn from his work. So he is a hes a very interesting, compelling figure. There's something quite tragic about him in many ways. There's something quite melancholy about a lot of his writing. Um, but he is one who is increasingly influential because I'm sure all of us, all three of us read the ideology essay or at least extracts from it at some point during undergrad it's kind of like the uh, text of french marxism on ideology and i think there's a lot in there um but uh, hopefully this might serve as an encouragement for people to check that out uh, as well as some of his other work uh, which um can be frustrating at times but can also be really quite exhilarating cool that's a really good introduction yeah, um, you should uh, introduce all of the rest of our podcasts. I feel like we can have uh, a very short, yeah. like, uh, hey, uh, here's John to tell you what feature. we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, I will, and I will drop back in. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, maybe um, maybe a cool place to start with the conversation on Althusser and Boer's work is just with the um, the quotation he uses to begin the chapter off. I think it's actually pretty interesting. Mm. Um <clears throat> so, uh, I'll just read it, I guess. Uh, so, uh, Althusser says, I remember this period as a time when perhaps I had a religious vocation which fizzled out and a certain predisposition to ecclesiastical eloquence. Marx did not say everything, not only because he did not have time, but because to say everything makes no sense for a scientist. Only a religion can pretend to say everything. So, um, the this introductory quote is really interesting um, because it uh, denotes a certain relationship between Marxism and Christianity or Marxism and any religion, I guess. Mm. Um, but in this case, Christianity, uh, the, that Marx did not say everything uh, gives us an inch of room to start thinking <laughs> about, uh, well, what religion says that Marx doesn't or what Marx says that religion doesn't. Uh, and I think that's a kind of helpful place to start thinking about these relationships between leftism and Christianity. Mm. Well, I think, I think the, uh, the kind of the idea that there are certain things that um, Marx, uh, that religion says that Marx didn't or can't is actually uh, kind of really uh, important and maybe is not said enough. I think this idea of there being uh, things that religion says that Marx does is perhaps where it gets into more contentious terrain for people because there's often, I think, um, I can't remember which episode it was in, but you folks were talking about there's this idea that kind of uh, Christians are generally very good at dealing with uh, individuals meeting in in the real world in the physical in physical environments. They're very good at kind of dealing with that and seeing whether kind of a situation is is moral, you know, and judging kind of individual actions in the world. But systemically speaking, and having a kind of understanding of the totality of so, of social, material, and historical relations. Christians generally aren't terribly good at that. That's that's a bit where they kind of fall down, and that's yeah, that's right. You know, this idea of systemic uh, issues and kind of systems being sin, being sinful, is something that Christians would suddenly struggle to sort of. Uh, I think having Marx's ideas there of 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 uh, having a systemic view on things is actually really helpful in many ways for Christian thought. And it's not something that's normally articulated within a Christian context, which is very suspicious of Marxism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I feel like uh, the the opposition that Althusser uh, sets up here is um, counter what usually seems to be the opposition that I find uh, talking to people who are suspicious of Marxism. Because um, they'll often say, yeah, well, Marxism thinks that it knows everything about the world, right? Like, it's got class struggle <laughs> and everything's predetermined. For religion, that's where, like, the mystery's at. You can't nail that down. So that's why I'm religious and not a Marxist. Um, I, like, just had that argument on the Internet the other day with somebody. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's fresh. It's real. It's out there. Um, 
And uh, it's just funny that Althusser is like, well, Marxism is, you know, we just accept that we can't say everything in uh, religions. They don't do that. It's kind of, I feel like both of those approaches, like that opposition, no matter which side ends up being the open-minded one, is kind of a, a bad opposition. But nevertheless, mm-hmm. it's interesting that Althusser is uh, using it as a way to, I don't know, expand some of his own kind of Marxist uh, work. I mean, yeah, he says specifically that um, to say everything makes no sense for a scientist, which is a really revealing thing for for him to say about Marx, and, yeah, and, right. and explains and explains a lot about how Althusser saw Marx because he wasn't he didn't see it as a kind of grand unified theory of literally everything everywhere. He saw it as a series of Marx's work as a series of scientific investigations into specific elements of political economy. And I think this, I think in in a way, it's really it's really kind of uh, uh, dangerous to, to for Marxists to go. Oh well, Marx, uh, oh, that criticism is really disingenuous. This idea of oh, Marxists think they can explain everything. When else I goes, no. There's a very specific thing that Marx sets out to do. There is one. <laughs> there is a specific thing that Marx is about, um, and only religion can do that. So I, I like. I think I, I I totally agree that it's maybe a strange opposition, but it is one that, like you, I've come across as well. Um, well, let's let's turn then to talk about a few of the things that um, are sort of basic in Althusser's inherited Catholic worldview. Um, things that uh, his religion says, but um, maybe Marxism doesn't say, that are kind of interesting. Um, yeah, John, you mentioned sort of the, like the, the moral point, and I think that's a huge deal. Mm. But there are two other kind of big ideas that play in Althusser's work that are explicitly religious and then also explicitly Marxist. And uh, Bohr, uh, Bohr says that they are original sin and like universality and judgment. Mm-hmm. Those are two religious ideas that have huge, uh, huge play in sort of like uh, leftist thinking as well. There, there are at least an, like analogs. Mm. Um, so, um, that's one thing, I guess, that Althusser thinks, or that in, it demonstrated by his life is something that, like, religions can say, but, uh, but leftist thinking has to incorporate somehow, or has to make up for. Um, so what do you think about those two points and how they play out in Althusser's work? Um, I mean, I think one of the big problems of, uh, Marxism, as we've been talking about, is this idea that it's kind of its own uh, eschatology. You know, it, it's like ah, this this kind of coming universal proletariat revolution, the communism that is is most definitely about to break into the here and now. And I think it's often really easy to uh, for Marxism and theology to become very blurred, uh, especially in slight, like slightly overheated political rhetoric. Um, and one of the things I quite like about um, Althusser's quite often slightly pedantic scientific writing style is that I think he's trying to avoid that, and that he has to—he feels like he has to be very careful and very responsible with the terms that he uses. As for original sin, I think that's another um, really valuable uh, way of thinking about it because if you uh, thinking about things from both a Marxist and Christian point of view, because original sin is is uh, in 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 the se- in a sense, you know, um, the my my Marxist side says, well, we're all in this together, <laughs> you know, the, like if all are if all are culpable, if all are in, in, imbricated in original sin, then it is from that ground of kind of mutual solidarity that you can. Uh, build something that doesn't require a certain hierarchy of judgment because why would you need that and then uh, and, and that can be translated into kind of organization across class lines there's a lot of kind of overlap between the two fields and it's very that clean easy demarcated distinction between them does not necessarily hold once you start to push at them a little bit and to see where they go yeah, I think so. Uh, it's funny to talk about original sin and uh, Marxism in particular because uh, the one time I was talking to the guy who leads the Communist Party of Canada here in uh, Toronto, and uh, his name's escaping me right now, which I feel really bad about. Uh, I should remember it, but I don't right the second. <laughs> um, anyhow, I was chatting with him, and he was a seminary student for a long time, 
And uh, we were just talking about Christianity. Like, he knew that I was a Christian and I was hanging out there and just wanted to shoot the breeze. And I was asking him, uh, so, you know, do you feel, like, uh, a tension between your, like, life now as the leader of the Communist Party of Canada and your Christian past? And uh, he said, he was like, well, like, I'm not really, like, I don't really know what I think about God and stuff like that anymore. So, like, that's not really a thing. But uh, he was like, I do find myself thinking in Christian terms. And one of them that he mentioned was original sin. He was like, uh, I just feel like original sin is the kind of thing that makes sense to me. Um, he, one thing that was very funny was, uh, he said, uh, anybody who organizes for a while, uh, inevitably comes up with, like, how, uh, comes up against how annoying other people are and, like, how frustrating <laughs> they are and how they like, don't come through for you. And he was like, I kind of feel like a misanthrope, uh, which is weird for a communist to say. But he was like, if you're a Christian, it has, it's not that weird. Cause you're like, no. well, yeah, of course, <laughs> like, people are bad. Uh, but that's exactly why you should, like, go to church with him. Um, and he was using that as a great analogy of like, that's exactly why you should build a society with them. And, yeah. you know, I, like that's always stuck with me. And I think that's a point that Bohr really draws out well here, actually. Oh, absolutely. This idea of like, yeah, it's like uh, this idea of the, yes, people are bad. Uh, I, I, even if you, even if you reject uh, total depravity, there's still the idea of like, we're all sufficiently bad, right? We're all like, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> You know, we're all we're all I, I, again. There's a there's a great um, book called uh, a cultural. I think it's called Original Sin: A Cultural History, which talks about the, that 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 idea that people are terrible, and this is why we need to make a better world for everybody. Has been a long kind of standing tradition of organizing solidarity, of organizing like practical movements, and those have been both religious and political, and those have been right. you know sometimes both and sometimes either or but i think that is one of the big ways that uh kind of leftist organizing and christian uh, uh missiology and christian church building go hand in hand <laughs> you know we're all we're all in this together you know all we have is 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 one another to get us out of this <laughs> uh there's like that really uh shoot let me look it up really quick um so the, the thing about um, original sin and being like sort of a, a building block for uh, solidarity and leftism is actually really good. Uh, sometimes, um, as a Protestant, I sometimes think about like, I don't know, original sin is actually a bad construction because of, uh, I guess, maybe like what it can do to you psychologically or something. But this whole conversation ma makes me think back to um, when we talked about Virilio and the Bunker Church, um, right. which is, uh, again, my favorite thing ever. <laughs> Anyways... Um, uh, when Virilio is talking about the construction and the architecture of the bunker church, uh, he's talking about like the the layout and about like the the side of the church that's for confession. And he again he says like um, where one says I admit that I'm a total bastard. Um, what I admit, you admit. You don't say I'm wonderful, I'm pure. And then on the other hand, as soon as you realize that you're a bastard at that moment, we can love one another. It's that type of solidarity I guess <laughs> that you find in original sin. Yeah. that's really good. Yeah, um, that I think is actually like not bad um <laughs> that's a, a a good theological point for leftism no i think that's i think that's an important thing to pick up on because uh kind of hyper calvinism and this this notion of total depravity has been used often as a cudgel uh as a rhetorical thing to to uh, induce guilt uh and induce kind of like uh this like and the problem with that is both political and theological, right? Politically, that's just a terrible thing to do to people. That is not a way to convince people into your kind of movement, whether that be a yeah. church or a party, by by constantly reminding them of their guilt and holding out the kind of only branch of salvation is through uh, you. <laughs> that's that that is not okay. And it's also it it doesn't build kind of any connection in between other people. And this is this is a thing that kind of the whole point of uh, that kind of confession, that that quote, is that it, you confess to one another, and it's through that that act of you both recognize who yourself, who you yourself are in relation to the other person. There can yeah. be a kind of, you know, that's where you love each other. Yeah, that reminds me too of when we were talking with uh, Derek Ford from the PSL a little while back about uh, Herbert McCabe, and Herbert McCabe has this essay about class struggle and Christian love, where uh, he. <laughs> 
He's like, well, the thing about the Sermon on the Mount is uh, you might think that it would say that you can't be a communist, but actually it's exactly the kind of thing that makes you a very good communist because nobody <laughs> wants to organize with somebody who's like not humble and kind. So, you know, <laughs> and I think like that's a really cool way of setting up, uh, I don't know, the relationship of how Christianity is trying to form you as a person with certain assumptions um, and then how that uh, kind of naturally, um, you know, leads into some of these political commitments. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I guess coming off this point, though, about solidarity and universality, it would be uh, a mistake not to mention the episode that we just made with Amaria um, <laughs> about universality. Um, so, I don't know, quick reminder, if you haven't listened to that episode, go do it, because it's really cool. Um, anyways, part of Amaria's deal was that there's like, um, there is uh, some expressions of universalism in Paul and other places in the Bible, but... Uh, there's oftentimes a remainder that we don't often think about. Um, there's still like the, the necessity of the slave or something um, that we have to think through that uh, expressions of universality uh, rarely are actually expressions of universality. Mm. And uh, sometimes there are people left out and we should think about that a little bit more clearly sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, that's a very good footnote uh, for this episode. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Universality is exciting and a great leftist idea, but uh you know, there are problems. Well, it's something that Bo picks up here in um, Altazer, where Altazer has a tendency to kind of universalize the church. You know, he, he writes about the church a great deal, but what he's really writing about is the French Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. But he has, this, right. he has this tendency of universalizing everything. And there's a neat thing that Bo notices that when uh, he finds something in the Roman Catholic Church that he likes, he universalizes it. He goes, ah, this is the, this this is the church. This is the church. Right. But when he when he when he finds something that he really doesn't like, he gets incredibly specific <laughs> and goes, no, this is the problem with the French Roman Catholic Church now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're right. Universality actually absolutely has to be something that is kind of wrestled with. And I think Althusser's practice of like you take what is potentially good and try to expand it but at the same time you have to be aware that within that institution there exists alongside the things which are good and we would like to see more of there exist things which we have to be ruthlessly specific in our critique of um his whole uh the point that really brings that out is he writes this uh i'm just scrolling through the chapter to try and find it he writes this essay about marriage uh yeah so it's this essay uh entitled uh, on on uh marriage where he's very specifically critical of the French Roman Catholic Church and the way that um, marriage is marriage uh, he, he, it is kind of framed as a, a in the 1930s is ref, is, ref, is refurbished Bo says as a sacrament of marriage um, dragging marriage and sex out of the dark and whispered domains of the domestic zone and placing them squarely in the public arena um, it, sex then becomes a sacrament that the couple administered to each other uh no longer just for procreation but for mutual pleasure uh there is this kind of what althazer calls an aggressive exhibitionism which is a, which, uh, but he isn't he isn't um his his point his the point that he's critical of is uh not that um oh they're doing this in public when it shouldn't be done like this but rather it's being used as a way of reinforcing um uh domestic labor of women and that's supposed to be something that is now celebrated. Um, he said, the bearing and raising of children is no longer a duty of Roman Catholic families. It now becomes a celebration in the public sacrament of marriage. And so women who've begun to have other options open to them found themselves tied to the long labor of pregnancy, birth and care for endless numbers of offspring. Uh, precisely through this ideology of sexual and spiritual equality, a glimpse of liberation now channeled into the public affront of the sacramenta uh, sacramentalization of sex folds back to reinforce the most reactionary of Catholic positions on the family. So he's a very, I think in some ways, a very astute critic of how ideology functions because he traces what should be a potentially positive and emancipatory gesture of, of a very specific moment in the church and uh, sort of argues that actually this is reinforcing some really uh, limiting and kind of uh, oppressive uh, reactionary positions. 
Yeah, it reminds me of uh, evangelicals, in my experience, the uh, the smoking high wife um, trend, if you're familiar <laughs> with that. Uh, so, you know, the idea is, uh, well, evangelicals, you know, we used to be, like, afraid of talking about uh, how much we love each other and how hot, like, hot babes are. Uh, but now we're, you know, as good evangelical men, like, we understand it's our duty to, like, talk about our smoking hot wife. And uh, we're going to do that all the time so that we don't seem, you know, like we're too down on sexuality. And meanwhile, the entire irony is that, like, evangelicalism is largely a politics of sexual limitations. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's still very, very alive, that exact uh, kind of um, mechanism that he's identifying. Yeah, we'll have to make sure we uh, we include that video of uh, the pastor at the NASCAR uh, situation. <laughs> Uh, with giving the prayer for his uh, smoking hot wife. Oh, <laughs> that's a real. Uh, we'll include that in the show notes. It's very good, a uh, really good uh, cultural moment for evangelicalism. <laughs> <laughs> but there's this there's this point that Al that Bo makes uh, that Al the apparent for for Al the apparent experience of emancipation was nothing more than a new form of servitude, and this is uh, one of the reasons why. Uh, and this is a, a classic and serious form of mystification, which is like the classic Marxist position on religion. You know, this is right. a mystification of, tr- of the true operations of ideological processes. Mm-hmm. And the, you need a Marxist there to tell you what exactly is going on. <laughs> that, that's why you need to get communists in church. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That is actually the why you need communists in church. You need, every <laughs> church needs some communists to expose the operations of ideological po- of uh, of ideological power and to question them because they can't necessarily be questioned upon their own terms. Yeah, it's like you need someone on your building committee. You need someone to do your finances, and like you need a <laughs> communist to tell you what's going on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's a really. Uh, I'm sold, man. I'm going to tell my uh, my church that. I guess that's why I'm on the committee there. Huh. Yeah, they're absolutely good Marxist critique, imminent critique of the operations of ideology uh, is actually, I think that's essential. <laughs> um, Bohr makes this comment in the essay where he says that Althusser was trying to make the step between his Catholicism and his communism as small as possible before taking it. So Bohr is like, yeah, Althusser does like intentionally try to leave his Catholicism behind and uh, maybe it stays with him in certain ways or whatever, but uh, he wants to stress that in leaving it behind, um, you know, Althusser is making it very easy to do that um, for himself. And Mm -hmm. I was reminded of this, uh, this quote that I put in the tiny letter from this past week, uh, by the way, we have a tiny letter. You can subscribe to it. We talk about Christianity and leftism. Uh, there's a I, quick plug, I guess. Uh, I'm subscribed and I think everybody should be. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's some good publicity. It, it that's why we had fact. you on. Uh, just to, uh, <laughs> keep uh, loosening our you guys here. Um, but uh, I put this quote in there. I'm reading this book by Antonio Negri, who's an Italian Marxist, who who really couldn't belong in a chapter on the Catholic Marxists in this book with Roland Bohr, I think. Um, and I think Negri are... uh, turns up in one of the later vo- in one of the later volumes. Oh well, there you go. Uh, it's interesting. the The book that I'm reading are letters that he wrote from prison, um, and in it, he's just kind of I don't know chatting with this other guy about like what he used to be up to and how he got into Marxism. And he has this quote uh, where he's talking about like, I, he doesn't really spell this out exactly, but I guess Negri like lived with a bunch of other um, Christian people in his younger years. And uh, he says, <clears throat> we did not understand that the choice of poverty was also an immediately av- anti-capitalist one. Uh, only in a distant future could that be argued not here among us. Uh, And then he goes on to say, perhaps, even though we didn't really understand it, we had in the life of the community intuited communism before we came to understand and critique capitalism. With Mm -hmm. boundless generosity, we lived as communists, and we were at the same time Christians, Catholics, and the people of Veneto. And I just felt like that really resonated in a certain way with what Althusser is is doing. Um, It's maybe a little bit more friendly, but there's something there. There's, 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 um, to respond to it, I think there's this great quote from Althusser when he writes to his former teacher he was he was sort of taught at a Catholic university and um, he explains 
what he's done and why he's done it. And he says that in actively rallying to the working class, we have not only not repudiated what had been our reasons for living, but have liberated them by fully realizing them. I think we deserve our future, even from Wilde's point of view, in that we have not disregarded our past. We've watched our past grow inside us and bear fruit in a manner far beyond the hopes of our youth. The Christian I once was has in no way abjured his Christian values, but now I live them. This is an historical, not a divine judgment, whereas earlier I only aspired to live them. Right. So he's he he I think would find a lot of agreement in that quote in those letters from prison that you know it's it, for him it is a kind of living it out in the moment you 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 will sort of inevitably become a communist. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Man, that's like a really a pretty beautiful quote and um not to completely, I mean, not to keep bringing up the Afton Institute, but man, they um, they never seem more, uh, literally more satanic than they do right now to me. <laughs> like, I mean, because like how, like how crappy of a Christian do you have to be to like, to to like actually like read these things and engage with people at church and like, um, but still, but still come up and be like a like a weird libertarian or somebody, somebody <laughs> seems, like. <laughs> to, to subscribe to an, an ideology that like um, supports the instrument the instrumentation oh my gosh support an ideology that supports the instrumentationalization of people towards like the ends of profit like that seems like the most insane uh, insane thing to hold in contrast like with a with a Christianity that's actually supposed to care about people um, it seems bizarre I think one thing I would say is that there is there is a good left critique happening but I'm worried that it doesn't necessarily go far enough. There is kind of the, the, like the mainstream response is like, oh, well, if you read the Bible, you'll see that really there is the there are these various things that should uh, come out of Christianity about concern for the poor, about concern for justice. And those are all true, but it's a disagreement with these very conservative evangelical positions on a kind of formalist level. And really, I, I, yeah. what, what, what should hmm. be said is that that... Uh, a theology which which seeks to instrumentalize people in the service of capitalism is not only wrong but kind of like a, a heretical it's a kind of distortion that has to be you know it, i feel like just going well christianity isn't that mean is not going far enough <laughs> you know yeah, we, yeah. we actually we actually have to say that like that that kind of evangelical uh libertarian capitalist uh religion is is not just uh, politically wrong, but theologically wrong as well. And I think the example of Althusser shows that you can do theological and political criticism at the same time, even if the tensions within it are sometimes difficult to maintain. Yeah, there's that point that Bohr makes actually about um, idolatry in relation to Marxism and uh, Catholicism that I thought was really good. That uh, if there's something that really unifies these things, it's basically like not tolerating idols, right? And uh, yeah. that's the thing that a lot of Christians do much too often with respect to other people who call themselves Christians in a troubling sort of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this, there's this idea of kind of uh, uh, just, just as with communists, it seems that Christians should have no toleration for idols. And the biggest, the biggest idol that the, the that is kind of critiqued from this point of view is capital is capitalism and it's far far easier to kind of follow that than it is to there seems to be something really authentic about that quote from althazar that i really i've i've I've, you know i find quite beautiful as well that you know how do you miss this how do you not get this (laughs) Yeah. yeah it's funny because i feel pretty suspicious of attempts to uh locate like an essential core of christianity um and often that creates a uh, kind of ideological base itself, uh, which is dangerous. But at the same time, like in my better moments, I feel like, yeah, well, if you were really a Christian, you'd be a communist. So, <laughs> uh, I think Althus Harris is channeling like the, the kind of feeling that I like to feel when I feel like pretty good going to church or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for having me on, for letting me, uh, come and, uh, talk about, um, come and talk about this. Uh, it was an absolute blast. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. We'll have to do it again. I would absolutely yeah. like if you wanna if you wanna do another uh, Marxist thinker, just uh, hit me up. Uh, I would be delighted to come back. Thank you so much.
Yeah, that would be so fun. Let's do that for sure. Thanks for listening to Magnificast. Uh, thanks again to John, the Lit Crit guy, for telling us what's up with Altusser and Catholicism. Hopefully we can have him back again to do some more theory time uh, because he is very good at it. As always, don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, follow us on Twitter at The Magnificast, sign up for our tiny letter, and support us on Patreon. You can find links to all of this stuff and uh, so much more on our website, themagnificast.wordpress.com. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church We'll meet down by the riverside There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no damn between us and our Lord